Welcome to the Walter Machado collection, where we'll take a look at the last few hundred games that this guy has put out. Yes, this guy has been very, very productive. And yes, it's pronounced Walter Machado, since he is from Brazil, but I will refer to him as Walter from now on, so keep that in mind. So, where do we start? Since I started my journey with Walter's games with the free-to-play title called Swarm Rider, we're going to start there. Swarm Rider is an endless hardcore runner mixed with 2.5D arcade shooting. The game itself describes it as a twin stick shooter, which is correct, but I don't play those games with controllers, so it's kind of weird to call it a twin stick shooter. You control a couple of mercenaries on a motorbike and try to survive as long as possible. The game is very simplistic, but challenging. And by challenging, I mean it's really, really, really challenging. But let us step back, relax, get something to drink and have a look at the most important part of the game, the menu. I will keep saying it, the menu is the face of a game. The first thing players will see and if something is missing or just looks bad, well then you already left a bad impression. How does Swarm Rider's menu looks like? There is a play button and a quit button. It actually shows your last score, your high score and something that looks like badges, but that's it. If I rated games, which I do not, this would mean zero points for the menu. I kind of understand why this menu is simplistic, but options is the bare minimum that I ask for. In this case, I can overlook it since I have a history with the game, but otherwise I wouldn't. It doesn't take away from the experience or adds anything to it, so yeah. Just keep that in mind that there is no menu, uh, it really pisses me off. Well, since there is no options to explore, let's start with the game. After starting the game, you're greeted by what I can only describe as EDM rock music and a pixel art, which looks very, very smooth. Your character can be controlled with WSD and will shoot automatically. The only thing that you have to do is aim and dodge. The enemies are some sort of tentacle eyes that just follow you from the left side to the right side. The funny thing is that you're actually not moving in itself. Lines constantly move from the right button to the left top of the screen and the motorcycle is constantly moving up and down, giving the illusion of you moving forward, but you aren't. The enemy called the Swarm doesn't seem dangerous at first, but soon enough they attack in a pattern that is annoying, but challenges you at the same time. Normally, enemies will just move towards you as a swarm, you can easily mow them down, but every now and again one alien will split up from the swarm, dive under or above the screen and try to move in front of you. I think the only way to describe how this game feels like is basically riding a wave. You have to constantly balance between moving around and prioritizing enemies. It's pretty good to be honest and it makes for entertaining gameplay. I would like to talk about the story, but there isn't much inside the game, so I would talk about the Ubermosh universe in general later on, just keep that in mind. So let's talk about achievements for a second, what I think is at the core of every one of Walter's games. This game has 4 achievements, which consist of surviving a certain amount of time, 150 seconds being the longest you have to survive. Since the game is challenging, you will have a hard time getting there, but when you're getting there, for the first time, your heart starts racing, your blood starts pumping, and in combination with the music, you get this high. You feel like you're getting in the zone, and this moment you forget that you're actually playing a game, and you feel like your life is depending on it. It feels amazing. I don't know, maybe you had this feeling before, but I never met the developer that could capture this feeling with every single game. And to be honest, Walter's games are not long, so getting this feeling out of me with every single entry in this whole Ubermosh universe, it's an amazing feat. So let's move on with the next game, Swarm Rider Omega. You see, Swarm Rider Omega is pretty much Swarm Rider with new features. The camera seems to be zoomed out a little, enemies are more aggressive, 
The driver of the motorcycle is gone and the menu is still missing. Everything. My beloved options aren't here, unfortunately, and you know, it still pisses me off. Instead of badges, you have achievements that are displayed as stacks, and should you complete them, they will be marked by a skull. This is kind of a downgrade. I like the badges better. They look better. They, you could actually take them as an initial design and just put on your I don't know, jacket, however. But this is a, pr a, pretty, a pretty substantial downgrade for such a small game. As an addition, we have things called class mods and they will determine how much life you have at the start of the game and how fast your special ability charges up. Special abilities range from shields to faster shooting rate to complete annihilation of the swarm. Having no class mod will give you 100% life and a slow charge rate. The striker class mod will leave you with 70% life and faster recharge rate and a burner will leave you with 40% life and very fast recharge rate. Again, the feeling of getting high when you're trying to finish the missions is encapsulated beautifully, but that is where everything ends. There aren't major changes to the game. If you played Swarm Rider and you want more of that, then you should play Swarm Rider Omega, I guess. But just be aware that Swarm Rider Omega costs something and Swarm Rider is free to play. So I don't know if it's worth a buy, but I will give my recommendations at the end, so stick around for that. Let's move on to something that is not connected to the Ubermosh universe called Trip to the Vinelands. TTTV is a weird game that I enjoyed, but what is TTTV? I would say it's a 2D scene based endless runner, but not really an endless runner because it only has 100 stages, so well, it doesn't really matter. Your job is basically to move the suit guy to one end of the screen. It doesn't matter which end, it just needs to be free of the wines. The challenge is the wines themselves because they will move and try to crush you. At some point, a mechanical wheels will start appearing to add a little bit of challenge. You can't touch those either. To be honest, uh, the hitbox of those things is very forgiving, so you won't feel cheated, but it's not what I would call easy. To shake things up, you're constantly changing between red colored scene and green colored scene. One seems to be more aggressive and the other seems to be less aggressive. It doesn't look consistent though, so I don't really know if that is how it really works. It seems there is also a little bit of laziness involved here because you might get the same stage uh, one after another just with uh, a different color or flipped on its head. So there are not 99 stages, at least I didn't count 99, but a few and they just get mixed together and changed uh, mirrored or anything like that. Maybe it is intentional, maybe it's like part of the story, but I don't see really the point of using the exact same asset just with a different color uh, if it is so often. Because I actually talked about another game called Asset Nimbus and they did the same thing, but they did it with one enemy per stage and not with the whole stage itself. So yeah, mm, I don't know how, what to think about that. Just if you want to buy this game, just keep that in mind. I would could it be repetitive a little bit. Your goal is basically to reach stage 99, and after reaching the scene 100, the game rewards you with a short clip. What does the clip mean? I have no idea, and I think it's not supposed to make sense. The music is as always very good, but the dev did go for my industrial sound, I suppose it's an acoustic representation of the wheel turning, but I don't really know. Again, the menu is minimalistic, which is bothering me still, but the game is more than competent enough, so I will overlook it. TTTV2 is, uh, well, it's pretty much TTTV1 with Blade Sauce. The funny thing is that I played through the game in 4 minutes. Yes, you heard correctly. I'm not even going to show you footage of this game because I don't know if anyone will ever beat this. Playing TTTV 2 for the first time and acing it. If you like the first game, you will also like the second game. It's pretty much the exact same. 
And again, both games capture this feeling of being on a high, but with a totally different type of game. Next game. Warp Zone Drifter. Well, I would say this is the black sheep of the Walter collection and the only game without a sequel. Let's talk about the menu first. It's the same thing with every one of Walter's games. I don't know, after the 10th game not having basic options like window mode is not the best looks. I kind of understand, but you know, I'm just tired of indie games forgetting or not implementing the most basic options into their games. I'm going to drop this point for the rest of the video, just keep that in mind when buying these games. All of Walter's games don't have options menu except Ubermarsh Volume 7. So, Warp Zone Drifter. What is it? You are a drifter that drifts towards warp zones. There is actually no other way I can explain the game. I'm going to try, but don't blame me if you don't understand. You are a driver from the top-down perspective, and as soon as you start the game, your car will move forward automatically. Almost like your driver just wants to die, because he or she lost everything? Maybe it's a connection to Swarm Rider? Huh? Maybe? Anyways, I would recommend playing with a controller, since it just feels better, but you can use whatever you want, to be honest. Since your driver is constantly accelerating as soon as you try to turn your car, you will drift. That is not an actual problem in itself and after a while you get the hang of it. Your mission is to drive your car over those warp zones to activate them, I assume, and after the first stage tentacles start to appear. You can drive through those tentacles but they will kill you if you touch them for longer than almost a second. I don't really know how long, but it seems that way and the dev seems to support this claim. There are also those things called seeds, which can be activated to get an extra point. The challenge here is to reach 21 points in 120 seconds. Doesn't look like much, but trust me, it's not that easy. One thing that is more prevalent here than in other games is screen shaking. It was barely noticeable in Swarm Riders and in TGTV screen shaking didn't exist, but here it is noticeable. Every time you drift or get hit by a tentacle or leave the screen, everything will shake. For people with motion sickness it would cause some problems, but it isn't game breaking. Music is on point, again, I don't think I have to mention that, so let's move on to the next game. Ubermush, the first one. If you are new to my channel, you probably don't know that, but I play a lot of indie, so-called twin stick shooters. I mostly refer them as arcade shooters since I played them with mouse and keyboard. Anyways, Ubermush is a 2.5D arcade shooter and I think it might be the best so far, in the indie scene at least. The crown is currently being held by Enter the Gungeon and I don't see a contender so far, but Ubermosh is definitely catching up. I think all of Walter's games look and sound amazing and they have amazing menu art, which is a good thing, I like that. Here we have more of the same, which is, like I said, not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I want more of this. But just add a damn menu. Walter, if you're watching this, please just add the basic menu with windowed mode and resolution, okay? But that's all I want. I'm not going to repeat myself since every Ubermarsh game has pretty much the same music and beautiful menu art. I just remember they all look and sound beautiful. I would point one out that looks really really bad, but that's it. We have six Ubermosh games to cover, so what I'm going to do is explain the main gameplay for the first one and then point out what changed in every consecutive Ubermosh. I will show the good, the bad and the improvements as well as, of course, my own opinion. So let's start with Ubermosh, the first one. I've already shown you Swarm Rider Omega and it had something called class mods. Well, the class mods are back. Not back, this is where they come from. 
you know, Ubermarsh was Walter's first game and it's pretty good for someone's first game. We have three different classes called Kensai, Gunner and Warlock. Kensai only allows you to hold a sword and no guns, but gives you six respawns which are equivalent to lives. The Gunner allows you to hold only guns, but guns are fully automatic and you have three respawns. Lastly we have the Warlock. This class gives you the strongest gun from the beginning, but you only have two respawns. I already mentioned that the menu is missing, but we have one option that you can activate or turn on, and that is hardboard mode. It makes the game harder and you should turn that on. Don't even play on normal mode, just trust me on this one, you are not going to have much fun on the normal difficulty and there is a simple reason for that. The game is supposed to be hard and challenging. The challenge is what is going to keep you playing because there is no story mode or anything, so yeah, the gameplay is first. You're just giving a list of achievements or missions and the arena, nothing more, nothing less. The achievements are shown the same way as in Swarm Rider, but it's actually the original game, so in context of this video, it's like Swarm Rider, but this is where it comes from doesn't really matter, I just want to mention it and even though this one is the original, the badges are not simply marked with a skull when you finish it, but with an individual symbol. I assume low-wise these are either badges of honor that the character wears proudly on her chest, pretty much like a general, but there's nothing that hints towards, so it's my personal headcanon. Well, th there is something, uh, the menu art actually changes depending on your high score, but you know, it's flimsy at best. I will talk about the lore of the game, but not right now since I would like to show the games first and then talk about the story in one go. Now that we covered the quote-unquote menu, let's move on to the essential part of the game, the arena. You might have noticed that most games so far didn't have any play button. But this one has. At the same time, this is the first game, so why does this game has a more complete menu than the other ones? Yes, I am still on the menu thing because it really pisses me off that a lot of indie devs just don't implement this stuff. And Walter, if you're watching this, please implement a goddamn menu. It's not that difficult. Okay, maybe it's difficult. I'm not a programmer. But you know, th this is basic stuff that belongs into your game. Sorry to say that, but it just belongs there, it's missing, it's really pissing me off, I played all of your games, I aced all of them, but you know, basic, basic menu, dude, basic menu. Now that I talked about my passion, the menu, let's move on to the game, for real this time. After pressing this big play button, you're dropped in the arena, like in typical 2.5D arcade shooter fashion, we have a square as an arena and walking out of the square will extract you from the arena. Yes, you don't die in this game, you get extracted. Why is this important? Well, normally games just tell you that your character died, so when a game tries to explain your death and why you can come back, it warms my heart. This shows me that the dev really cares, actually thinks about what the implications of death is. Your death means you're dead you can't come back. This game has an explanation for that. Either way, you play as the Blade Saint, and you're always dropped in the same arena that is littered with some unnatural stone formations. The Blade Saint is represented by this pixel character in the middle of the screen. I liked the Blade Saint from the Swarm Rider games more, but after a while you don't even notice her anymore since there are more pressing issues like enemies. You navigate with WSD, aim with the mouse, shoot with the left click and use the sword with the right click. Depending on the class you're using, things might change. For example, the Kensei class will only use a sword, therefore you can use your sword with the left and the right click. Guns work the way you might think they work, but swords can actually reflect bullets. It doesn't mean that you are invulnerable though, since you have to deflect at the right time and in the right direction. The game is forgiving, but you can't just swing your blade all the time. I do, because I'm a dum-dum, so 
take it with a grain of salt. When you kill an enemy, they will drop a weapon without fail. Every enemy will drop a weapon and will leave blood on the ground. After a while, the floor will look like a beautiful mosaic painting, especially because the blood and the guns of the enemies are actually colored. You can pick up weapons by walking over it and your character will change weapons regularly except if she picks up the strongest weapon which is a good thing because as soon as you get that weapon you probably don't want to drop it. Weapons are different versions of laser weapons. We have a green laser shotgun, a blue laser BFG, a blue laser sort of double barrel shotgun and of course the best gun, the red laser shotgun BFG. This gun just wrecks everything and makes the screen shake like crazy. Coupled with the sound of the gun, it gives me the feeling that I'm actually shooting a BFG. Unfortunately, this might cause some problems with people that have sensitive eyes, so be aware of that. Unlike in Swarm Rider, in which you try to survive as long as possible, here you have a time limit of 100 seconds. If you survive those 100 seconds, you finish an event. Everything I mentioned so far is pretty much the whole game. You could just go now and not miss much because from now on I will explain what just changed from title to title. And Ubermosh at its heart just stays the same, pretty much like, I don't know, the Call of Duty series or the Battlefield series. It's a shooting game, you know, it's pretty much the same. I have a few things I want to talk about though and that is for the whole rest of the Ubermarsh series and then we will move on to the next titles. The dev seems to play a lot with vision, we will see that with other games more. And we saw that with Swarm Rider a little and Warp Zone Drifter had a lot of screen shake. But here it is way more noticeable. Enemies play into the whole vision thing and field of vision. It took a while until I realized that enemies don't actually spawn from the outside of the arena borders. They actually teleport right outside of the field of vision. And since the camera is really zoomed in, you will sometimes run in on direction and get shot in the face. So you should be careful moving in general. The thing that took me a while until I realized that is how enemies attack. In the beginning, I thought the enemies would start shooting where they get inside of your field of vision. But that's not how it really works. They actually get inside of your FOV and wait for a few seconds, but if you saw them once already, they might shoot on sight. One last thing I want to talk about is how to survive the 100 seconds, because it is not easy, like every one of Baldur's games. I have one strategy that seems to work well. You can do that with any class except the Kensai. After starting the game, try to find a rock formation that forms a tunnel. You can find that mostly at the right side of the arena, but they are everywhere. From here you can shoot left and right all the time and move in a circular manner. With a little bit of training, you will be able to survive the 100 seconds easily. I think we covered pretty much everything about Ubermosh, the first one. Ubermosh Black is the next entry in the series, and it's pretty much Ubermosh the first one. It adds a new class called the Catalyst, and a new ability called the Brain Clap. Brain Clap is basically a screen wipe that activates after a certain amount of kills that are actually called KOs in universe. The Catalyst class only needs 50 of those KOs to activate the Brain Clap. The other ones need 60. Every other class works the same way as the last game, but the respawns have been changed a little, nothing major. We have new missions and also a new enemy that drops a new weapon. Imagine the BFG, just bigger, it shoots yellow laser bullets and makes the screen shake even more. The rest of the game is pretty much more of the same. It is good more of the same, but more of the same nonetheless. Sure, a few things change, like the menu art and how the menu is presented, but it's not essential to the game itself. You should activate the hard-boiled mode here too. Trust me on this one, just do it, otherwise you won't have a challenge. The survival strategy for this game didn't actually change. If you follow the instructions for the first Gabermush game, you should be fine.
Next, we have Ubermosh Volume 3. Volume 3 gets rid of the square arena, makes it an infinite field and zooms out the camera a little. I don't know if that's an improvement. I like this version more, but the two first ones had their places. There is not much new, we have a new class called the Psyker that only needs 40 KOs for the Brain Clap. To force the player to move in the big arena, there is a new enemy that I would call the Swarm. They are a swarm of dots. It is pretty disappointing, sorry, but if you have a game that looks that good, dots don't really fit in the art style. That's pretty much it. The game might have the most beautiful art so far and you should turn hardboiled mode on. Don't forget that, because otherwise you will not have a challenge. The survival strategy from game 1 and 2 might not work here, so try to juke and shoot. Yeah, I, I have no strategy for this game. It's fun though, so try it out, I guess. Game number 4 is Ubermosh Wraith. Here we have volume 3 with one more class, a new slash revised mechanic and a new enemy. The new class is called Wraith, like the title. The revised mechanic is the Brain Clap, but now it's called Mana Strike. I might be wrong here because sometimes it seems that the Brain Clap activates itself and the Mana Strike doesn't. I, I don't really know, I still don't know. I, I watched at the footage that I recorded, but I still cannot distinguish what a Brain Clap is and what a Mana Strike is. So I might be wrong here, I don't really know how it works. If you know it, just explain that in the comments, that would be fine. Anyways, you can also choose how your mana strike should work. You can choose to have a frontal, a reverse or a circular mana strike. I always go with the circular mana strike, but it doesn't have a huge effect on your game. Just take whatever you like the most. The new enemy is pretty cool. It looks similar to your character and mostly holds the red laser BFG, but it also has a shield. The shield will block any damage for a few seconds, but it definitely changes the tides of the game since you have to wait out the shield to shoot at the enemy. Forcing you to move away from the enemy or try to juke around the enemy until the shield drops. Next game, Ubermosh Volume 5. Okay, I have to talk about the naming conventions of these games. Here we go, we have in order, Ubermosh. Ubermosh Black, Ubermosh Volume 3, Ubermosh Wraith, Ubermosh Volume 5. You want to know the name of the next two games? Ubermosh Centricide, Ubermosh Volume 7. Um, what? Oh, shit. I'm seeing it now. I want to say it's stupid. I mean, it's still stupid, but there is a system to it. So every uneven game has a number, except the first one. And every even game has a name. Ah, it is still stupid. Just call it volume 1 to 7 and add the subtitle, like black to it. Okay, let's move on to volume 5. This might be my favorite Ubermosh with the worst menu art. You know, until now we had incremental changes. But this one goes full cycle. Tech was added, which can give you a shield or a melter. These things don't change the gameplay that much, but they are pretty cool addition. And the dev added something way cooler. Double guns and double swords. Yes, you always hold the double amount of guns and the double amount of swords. I think dev also overhauled the sound since everything sounds a little bit better. The menu art looks not on par with the other ones, I already mentioned that. And one of the menu wheels looks out of place, but if I would recommend any of the games, it would be this one. Ubermosh sent aside. Imagine Ubermosh Volume 7, one step back and two steps forward. We have a new difficulty, a new slash revised tech and new enemies and weapons. The new difficulty is called sent aside. You know what to do with it. The tech from volume 5 has been revised and the ability to hold two guns has been demoted to a character progression during an event. You start with a weak character and the more you kill, the more tech you activate. The good thing is you can have three guns now. 
It plays as amazing as it sounds. The new enemy is a guy, I don't really know how to describe him, but his gun is pretty cool. It shoots green laser sickles. Enemies have shields again, and the swarm is back. Okay, now we are done so far. There is volume 7, but the game will get its own video since it's much bigger and different game. And it is in early access, and I typically don't touch those. So let's talk about lore now. I said I will talk about it, and I will. But in a retracted version. There will be a separate video in the description, hopefully. We have a few things that are revealed in the game itself. Every game so far had a tutorial, and in those tutorials we have an announcer. The announcer of the first game is a random guy that is supposed to sound like Morgan Freeman. I don't hear it, but whatever. He mentions a colony that gives everything to their population except for violence. Therefore, you are sent to the deserts of Utokar, that is the planet you are on, and if you die, you are respawned. Remember that I like the reason why you can simply come back, because you are extracted before you die. Look at that, we even have a reason why your character is killing all those sentient beings. People want to see some blood. The second game tells us that 200 years has gone by and Ubermarsh is an actual sport. If it was established as a sport after the Saint of Plains or was a sport from the get-go, I don't really know, but since Swarm Rider and Omega are also part of the Ubermarsh universe, I assume it wasn't. I will go deeper into that in the lore video, but for now, that's enough. The announcer of the third game is the dev himself, and how do I know that? Let me flex for a second here. I can speak Portuguese and the developer is also Portuguese. Guess what exists on YouTube? A dev interview in which he admits being the announcer. I assume he ditched the voice acting because voice acting costs a leg in an arm. Back to the story. Our protagonist is known as the Blamed Saint and I assume praised almost as an godlike entity since she has followers and she has to enlighten them. The next game establishes her as a god, and that's pretty much it. She was a criminal or something, a mercenary, and ascended to godhood. I like it, it's pretty flimsy, I think the dev could do more with that, but it actually explains why you can respawn and why you are killing things. So, I am on the 11th page of the script, and I think this should be enough to cover all of Walter's games. Recommendations. Y you know, normally I would explain why I should buy something or not, but on this one I would just say buy the bundle on Steam. All of Walter's games so far, as I know, are under 20 bucks. Just buy the bundle. I don't know if you're going to have fun with it, but once you get that one high I explained earlier, it will probably be helped. If everything I showed you so far or looks like trash to you, please just leave. I have seen some really shitty posts researching for this video and I kind of don't want this anymore. One thing that came up that was really prevalent was the oh, this game is pretty much the same game as the last one and it's pretty much a copy-paste job uh, for 99 cents. Uh, I have a few things. First of all, all of those games are pretty pretty cheap. I think they don't, don't exceed 5 bucks except the uh, volume 7 which is a way bigger game. And how is this any different than Call of Duty in any of those games in which you pay $60 every time? And the other thing is you have to see the Ubermarsh series as uh, basically levels. Uh, if you would put Ubermarsh 1 to 6 in one game, compile it as one game, and make you like a level base, so this is the first level, the second level, and then put some cutscenes in between, then this would pretty much be a $20 game. And $20 is what the Walter Machado bundle costs, so it fits pretty much like a glove, you know? Yeah, as always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, leave a like, subscribe, let me know which of all these games is your favorite one. Take care of yourselves. Have a nice day and we will see each other next time.